and welcome to your region this week. I'm Anandi Carol Willery. It's been a busy week, so let's get started. MP Lloyd Longfield made an announcement in Guelph on Wednesday, announcing an investment into the Second Chance Employment Counseling Offices on Norfolk. We spoke with MP Longfield about the investment. I'd like to thank Second Chance for hosting us and to Chris Baginski Hansen for her tireless advocacy and phone calls and <laughs> keeping me in touch with what you need and how we need to deliver it. First of all, Second Chance has had a program in place that we funded back in 2018 to take them to 2020, October 2020. This is a booster to that program. The 455,000 is to extend into other areas to try and help uh, to get creative with getting people placed into employment. Our plan ensures that no one is left behind. And right now, we can't afford to leave anybody behind. When everybody has a fair chance of success, we all benefit. At the beginning of May, Prime Minister Trudeau hosted the first ever Youth Summit in Ottawa. Prime Minister Trudeau has made a commitment to young Canadians and that's really clear. In fact, he's chosen to become the Minister of Youth himself to make sure that our concerns are at the centre of the government decision-making. Decision we are very much, with all of our funding, we are very much um, evaluated on our success. Right. Not just the number of people that come in the door, but the number of people who, who have jobs and the number of people who have jobs three months later. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a long-term process and it's long-term supports and it's working with it's working with everybody um, and it, it's just changing the way business has to be has to be done mm -hmm. and even as a business we recognize that we've had to change how we've done things and that's well. why they get the funding <laughs> <laughs> this is it, it's a huge honor it's a huge responsibility but I know my team, and I know that the, the staff here, the community, have supported us. The staff have worked tirelessly on these types of programs. They're dedicated to the youth. We work hard to make sure that we're seeing results. Um, so it's a huge responsibility, um, and it feels great. I can't lie. It, it just feels that now I can concentrate on the youth and what we have to do for them, not on where the money is coming from. And um, that's where our energy should be, quite honestly. On Thursday, we were live on location at the TD Kitchener Blues Festival. I spoke with Rob Barkshire and Joe Cormier on what's happening this weekend. Hi, we're live on location at the TD Kitchener Blues Festival in downtown Kitchener. I'm here with Rob Barkshire, who is the president, and Joe Cormier, the volunteer director. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Well, thanks for having us here. I am so excited about this weekend. Tell me about what this event is all about and what musical goodies do you have in store for us? Uh, this is the 19th edition of the TD Kitchener Blues Festival. We're bringing in blues artists from all across Canada, the United States. We have one entertainer coming in from Australia. And uh, it's just great blues music, Grammy Award winners, and uh, outstanding musicians. We have three great stages. It'll be free all weekend other than a ticketed show this evening. Awesome. And how you said that this event has been going on for 19 years. Sorry, Are no. you the founder of this event? I'm not the founder, oh. but I was at the first event, which took place right here. And this was a single stage, seven acts on a Saturday afternoon. And I was in the crowd. The second year I volunteered, and I've been to everyone and been volunteering ever since. Excellent. Now, what artists will be playing here over the weekend? Oh, we have a host of uh, amazing, amazing people coming. Lockie Doley, as I said, is a fellow from Australia who's an incredible keyboard player. Everything from Harrison Kennedy, who's a great solo artist. Vanessa Collier is an up-and-coming blues act from the U.S. Uh, uh, we have Misty Blues opening tonight for Tom Cochran and Red Rider. Later on Saturday, we'll have Kim Mitchell. We have a tribute to Woodstock tomorrow night in the park. There's just so much. There's so m We have a children's stage with some acts geared for the smaller blues fans. So it's just a great weekend and nonstop music, really. And as I say, other than tonight, it's all free. So let's get a lay of the land then. We're, these stages are, you said there are three stages, and they're in downtown Kitchener. And right now, we are at City Hall, so maybe we'll kind of point in that direction. So tell us about the stages. Where are they? 
Uh, we have the YNC stage right here in front of Kitchener City Hall. Uh, it's being set up as we speak. The stage will come tonight. Uh, we have the OLG stage, which is in Victoria Park. Uh, big tented stage. Uh, that's where Tom Cochran and Red Rider will be tonight and Kim Mitchell on Saturday and a whole bunch of other great acts throughout the weekend. And then we have the smaller stage that's located at the, it's called the BIA stage. It's sponsored by the uh, Kitchener Biz Downtown Business Improvement Association. And uh, that's located at King and Frederick Street. And uh, we kind of program that stage. That's if you really want to hear and see live blues music, go to that stage because that's where you're gonna get a good dose of good blues music. Your region this week continues right after this. See you soon. Welcome back. On average, one child dies every year from being left inside a hot car somewhere in Canada. 570 News' Brandon Graziano speaks with Lewis Smith from the Canada Safety Council on what needs to be done to prevent this. So, uh, I mean, this is uh, still, I mean, one is still one too many, uh, at least in my opinion anyhow. But uh, what's the big reason do you find that people leave their kids in cars? Well, you know, the big reason does tend to be forgetfulness. Um, it, it's worth pointing out that obviously with, with one fatality per year, which you're right, is still way too much, um, we're, we're, still, we're hit with the blessing and the curse of having a, a very small data set. Um, it, it's a blessing, of course, because it means fewer fatalities, but it's a curse because uh, when you're dealing with smaller data sets, specific factors can tend to be a bit overblown. Uh, but in this case, I think it's, it's fitting that forgetfulness tends to be the more common um, um, feature in these fatalities because... It, it, oftentimes it involves a change of routine. You know, a parent who's not expecting to have the child with them, they're, they're dropping them off at daycare when they don't usually do so, for instance, and uh, that they, they just forget that the child is there. It's, it's scarring, and it's something that no parent should ever have to deal with. Um, and more often than not, it, it's made even worse by the fact that it's not out, out of negligence. It's just a matter of a, a shift in the usual routine. Uh, are there any other attributing factors aside from forgetfulness? Yeah, you know, there, there can be. Um, Sometimes, in very rare cases, these incidents are deliberate, and those are different uh, category entirely as far as, uh, you know, you, you don't really feel bad for the parent who's deliberately killing their child. Uh, but those are few and far between. As a general rule, forgetfulness does tend to be the common overarching factor. Lewis Smith joining me this morning, a manager of national projects at the Canada Safety Council. We're talking about the fact that a new study done by the Hospital for Sick Children concluded that an average of one child a year dies across Canada after being trapped in an overheated vehicle. Uh, Lewis, um, what's the most common excuse you hear from parents about leaving kids in a car? Well, I'm not sure excuse is necessarily the right word here, Brandon. Uh, oftentimes it is. Uh, it, it's, it's a matter of, as I said, routine changing. Um, we really don't like blaming parents on this because, yes, there is an element of personal accountability that needs to come into play, but at the same time, this is a very common psychological reaction to a change in routine. Uh, you're, you're, you're so used to doing things a certain way that your mind goes on autopilot, and by the time you might realize that your child's been left alone in a hot car, it's too late. So uh, what we like to do, rather than a point blame or, or point fingers or suggest that there's, there's blame to go around, uh, we like trying to find solutions, something as simple as leaving something you'll need during the day, whether it's a wallet, an ID card, a key, uh, in the back seat with your child. So when you go to grab it, which you'll need to do to get through the day, uh, you're aware that your child is there. And for those who are passing by, uh, I mean, I mean uh, as you said, you know, there's new technologies that are going to be coming out, but at the same time, that may not be your car. Uh, so you might not get that notification. Um, what if we see a child in the car? What to do? Uh, call 911, always. Um, with older uh, people, uh, adults and seniors to a lesser extent, um, there is that, that less 
pressing urge because you get the, the, the sense, the, the feeling that that person is able to t- take care of themselves much more than a child. Uh, with a child's body, we're talking about uh, autonomous systems that aren't fully developed. And especially when we're talking about young children, uh, they, their own safety should never be put in their own hands. Um, these kinds of incidents can happen in a matter of minutes, and it's imperative to get help as soon as possible. And of course, if we do the same thing even during the winter? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just because there's snow on the ground, just because there's ice on the ground, doesn't, it doesn't make the sun beam any less bright. Right on. Uh, Lewis, have I missed anything here? Um, I think just, just one thing to, to point out here, and that is that uh, in the U.S., we do see about 37 fatalities on average. And uh, traditionally, when we don't have Canadian stats, we use a, what we call the 1 in 10 rule. So we've been saying roughly 3.7 fatalities per year. Uh, but this study certainly lines up with what would be common sense, because in the U.S. there's also a much hotter climate, and uh, summer months tend to last much longer, especially sub- south in the country. So comparatively, one fatality a year tells us, you know, on the one hand, we're on the right track. On the other hand, as you pointed out at the very beginning of this, one fatality is one too many. Lewis, I really appreciate your comments. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Wellington is one of the only areas that rewards residents for recycling properly. If nominated, you could be receiving a gold-colored recycling bin at your front door. We spoke with the county and a resident on the initiative. Well, the Gold Box program is basically a reward program to acknowledge residents' recycling efforts. It was uh, initiated a number of years ago to um, bring awareness to recycling issues, to encourage people to recycle right, and that basically means sorting your materials, rinsing them, and putting only the acceptable items in the, in the blue box. It's uh, got a lot of interest. We have a lot of people nominating themselves, and uh, recently especially it's, it's been getting some attention, and so we find it's, uh, it's a great way to get the word out about how to recycle right, how to put the right things in the blue box, and um, it's been a great tool to just raise the awareness to these ver- various recycling issues. It's a self-nominating process, so people need to go online and uh, they can find a form to self-nominate themselves. And if they choose, they can give us a call or an email and we'll help guide them through the process if they can't find the, uh, the nomination part on our, on our website. I think I missed the initial window, so um, I, have a, I applied for it in spring and then I think it was the following spring when I no- was notified that I was awarded a gold bin. It's um, very gratifying when you've tried so hard for so long uh, to be recognized in a way that's meaningful. Yeah. In uh, this day and age, uh, there's been a lot of media attention around some of the challenges around recycling, and uh, those have been caused for a number of uh, issues, primarily overseas and whatnot. But um, the important thing is that people understand that it's more important than ever to recycle right, to, to really, uh, if you're unsure of what belongs in the blue box or unsure of how to prepare the recycling, please reach out to us. We're happy to help you out. Your region this week will continue right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. 519 Sports Online meets with Mark Vicentine, a World Junior Silver and Bronze Medalist from Cambridge, visiting the Rick Hines Goalie School to share some of his expertise. I'm here for you guys, so don't be afraid to ask. Okay? Any questions before we start? Awesome. I just ask you guys work hard, we don't get frustrated, we have a little bit of fun. Sound good? All right, let's go. Cool. He is a familiar face for Canadian hockey fans. And this week, Mark Visentine is visiting Cambridge. I think being from, you know, around the Cambridge area, growing up in Waterdown, I think it, it's a lot of fun for me to give back to, to the goalies that are kind of following the same footsteps that I did. Visentine is a two-time member of Canada's World Junior Team, winning a silver and bronze medal. Now he is sharing those experiences, helping out at the Rick Hines Goalie School. 
what I love about uh, the group here as the kids get older is they tend to care more and they're not just here to go through the motions. They're here because they want to learn. They want to get better. And that's kind of where I flourish as a coach. Um, you know, for me, if I'm working with a goaltender that cares and they want to get to the next level, I, I'm there 100 percent. I have their back and I'll do whatever it takes. He has fun, right? The kids are smiling. He's smiling. They're having fun. They're happy, right? It's not you know, stone-faced, everything, it's a lot of, and, you know, when people are happy, when people are engaged, they're going to learn better, right? And he has that, uh, that ability with the kids. His focus is having fun and skill development, and you can quickly see him building a strong rapport on the ice with the netminders. He's providing solid advice for goalies heading into their major or minor midget seasons. In the summertime, we have more time to kind of break drills down and work on the good little habits such as tracking the puck, trying to read the shooters, um, trying to get an idea of, okay, is this guy going to shoot glove? Is he going to shoot blocker? Because if we're a goaltender, we can read that shot before it's been released. It can make a big difference in our rebound control, which like I was explaining to the kids today, sometimes having good rebound control, you can eliminate five, 10 shots against the game, which could eliminate, you know, three, four, five scoring chances. Byzantine recently retired from hockey and is currently attending the University of Guelph, working towards a business degree. But he still wants to be involved in the game and giving back is something he's very passionate about. I'm here for the kids. Uh, I don't like to just, you know, commit myself in, in one town. I like to kind of go around, whether it be at Niagara where I play junior, Hamilton, I'm here with Tim in Cambridge. Um, but it takes those goalie coaches to give opportunities to younger coaches that may have less experience like myself. And for Tim to give me that experience, uh, it's, it's been nothing but fun for me, and I'm always going to give it my best. His playing career included time with the OHL's Niagara Ice Dogs, and he enjoyed a short stint with the Phoenix Coyotes in the NHL. Byzantine was a first-round draft pick, 27th overall of the Coyotes, and also spent time overseas and in the American Hockey League during his 11-year career. He had a great career for when he was going, right? You can look at it, you can look him up on Hockey TV and see all those things that he's done, right? Stuff that a lot of people would only dream of. I think I learned a valuable lesson through sport to, to really appreciate the success you have. But I learned so many uh, valuable skills that I'm just now learning transfer into the real world, work ethic, you know, passion for what you do, details. There's so many skills that athletes might not know they get through sport, whether it be hockey, baseball, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm just learning now how important those skills we learn and transfer into the real world. Waterloo Regional Police released new video footage on the sexual assault case involving the young girl from Brybeck Crescent in Kitchener. We've recently released a timeline video that shows steps that the suspect took before and after the latest sexual assault that happened on July 6, 2019. We're again appealing for information from the public. So far we've received hundreds of tips that have helped us to establish this timeline. But again, we are appealing to the public to take a look at the video, uh, look at the suspect, uh, look what he's wearing, um, and look at the vehicle as well. And if you can identify him, to please contact investigators by calling our tip line, which is 519-570-9777, extension 8191, or leave an anonymous tip with Crime Stoppers. We are encouraging the public to take a look at the video. The suspect's car can be seen prior uh, to the sexual assault happening, where he's in the parking lot at an address on Brybeck Crescent, and then you can see the suspect running in the video uh, shortly after the sexual assault as well. So we are asking people to take a look at the video. We believe that someone can identify who this person is, and we're asking them to contact investigators or leave an anonymous tip through Crime Stoppers. Your region this week will continue right after this. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Each year in August, Dairy Queens across Canada present their Miracle Treat Day. In Brantford, all three Dairy Queen locations donated proceeds from the sale of their blizzards to McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation. Today is Miracle Treat Day in Brantford and actually all across the country, uh, where all net proceeds of the blizzard sales go to the McMaster Children's Hospital in our case. Uh, in the rest of the country, it goes to all their local children's hospitals. So it's just a great day to get the community involved and uh, be part of a, an amazing event. So I started with Dairy Queen back in September once I moved back to Brantford. Um, my family's been really involved in the community ever since I was younger. Um, so that's been something I've, that's been instilled since I was very young. Um, but particularly for me, um, with what happened when I was born and later when my daughter was born with some complications, organizations like this can really impact and help families when they're in that time of need. Um, so any small way that we can give back, it's, it's really great to get involved in that way. It's just, it, it, it helps out. This is our local children's hospital and it, it helps the children of our community that need it and we're here to help. And we're always looking for more uh, corporate uh, partners to be involved with us that, that may not have been involved with community organizations. And this is just a great opportunity to do this. The Waterloo Regional Police started a campaign on collecting backpacks for children in need. We met with Constable Andre Johnson about the campaign. We are hosting our second annual backpack challenge for 2019. Last year we had a successful inaugural backpack challenge where we had about 1,400 backpacks donated throughout Waterloo Region for children in need. So again, we're calling on the community to step up and to donate uh, backpacks for, for children of all ages. We are partnering again with the Family and Children's Services Foundation for Waterloo Region, and they are particularly asking for backpacks uh, for older children as well as gift cards so that they can do the shopping themselves. So all of our divisions will be open and accepting donations. We're asking for backpacks, we're asking for school supplies, whatever you can donate to help children children throughout the region. That's all for another episode of Your Region This Week. For more information on the show or if you have a story idea, visit our website rogerstv.com and fill out the proposal form at the bottom. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.